Hello and welcome everyone. This is Active Inference Guest Stream 28.1. It's October 14th, 2022. Today we are going to be hearing and discussing Reconceiving Rationality by Giovanni Rolla. So Giovanni, thank you so much for joining. Very much looking forward to this presentation and discussion. So off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure to, to receive your invitation a couple of months ago, and I am delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to discuss my work. Um, as per your request, um, our suggestion, I am uh, presenting this paper I wrote a couple of years ago, and uh, as we were talking the backstage, I have... Uh, I, I've, I've changed my mind a few times and I'm going to make this clear during the presentation since I published that paper. But it, will, it is a pleasure nonetheless to, to have the chance to, to present this view here and uh, to, to share it with the world. So I'm very happy. Uh, so we'll be talking about reconceiving rationality. And this is the, this is the, 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 the itinerary I was thinking about presenting to you. So first I'll be talking about rationality and contentless cognition. Then I'll present my view, which I called radically inactive rationality, and say a few words about agency and proficient interaction and reasoning and rationality. I'll close with a couple of objections. The first one being that whatever I'm presenting here is uh, too liberal in a way excessively liberal it encompasses too much and the second objection which i think is the one that may interest you the most is whether uh, it is in fact compatible with predictive processing or predictive coding which is of course in the vicinity in, in the it's near the the, the to, of course it's central to to, do, to active inference so here is the here is the sorry the my, my initial thoughts on the matter is that traditionally the, the very uh orthodox view on rationality uh assumes to, to the most of my knowledge it's as an assumption really that rationality must entail reasoning that for instance a belief b and an action a are rational if and only if there is the reasoning that underwrites the B or A. So, and of course, it's just not any reasoning. The reasoning in question must accord with certain certain uh, formal benchmarks, such as uh, classical logic or probability reasoning or heuristics. So, believing and acting rationally according to this traditional view require meeting certain formal standards. And this, as I said, it seems to me to be. Uh, largely an assumption about what it means to be rational, about defining rationality in terms of reasoning. So if rationality requires reasoning, and if reasoning involves the evaluation of beliefs against certain formal benchmarks, then rationality implies contentful cognition, where content, I take it to be minimally having accuracy conditions, being capable of being uh, right or wrong, or in, or in, on a more uh, weighted notion being true or false. So the idea here is that rationality necessarily involves content. It involves beliefs, reasoning, and um, the comparison or... Sorry. Software update right now. Software update. <laughs> sorry, there was a, a pop-up in my window <laughs> over here. So... Um, that would be, I think, the, the standard view on rationality. And if it is so that rationality necessarily involves content, it, in, it is a, a good fit with classical cognitivism or cognitivism in general, which is the view that cognition um, necessarily involves representational content, at the very least. For some cognit cognitivists, of course, it might involve also um, uh, conceptual content, but at the very least, representational content, which has uh, accuracy conditions. But this classical view is not so good, uh, does not provide a, a so good fit with radically inactive and embodied cognition, 
which I am here uh, thinking not specifically on radical and activism by Hutu and Main in their recent books, but I think it also challenges other views that are not presented as radically inactive, but of course they share some core tenets with radical and activism. We could call them uh, radically embodied views of cognition, such as um, the views presented by Ezekiel de Paolo, Berman and Brandian in uh, Sensory Model Life. You also have Gallagher's enact vari variety of an activism in his 2017 book, and also the, um, I mean, the, the view by by Tony Kemero in his 2009 book on ecological psychology and dynamical systems. They all share common tenets, and here I am. Uh, I know this is very controversial, but I'm treating those views as uh, radically embodied views of cognition, and but I'm specifically focused on radically inactive views of cognition. They all say that uh, not all cognition is representational, contentful, which is in a way to say that we can think of basic contentless forms of cognition or a contentless level, basic level of cognition, which emerges through the active exploration of one's environment. And beyond radical and activism by Hutu and Min, this could be, uh, this, this idea could be cashed out in terms of mastering sensory motor engagements, a matter of know-how, the knowing how to engage with your surroundings instead of knowing that stuff are so and so around you. So this is very clearly what Di Paolo and colleagues and uh, Kimero, for instance, do in their books. Uh, Radical and activism has a certain um, tendency to skew sensory motor engagements, sensory motor schemes, etc. And uh, but, but recent developments have, I think, incorporated that. So the, the, this is the gist of that, the, the gist of that, this idea, right? So if we combine radically embodied views of cognition uh, or radical and activism and um, the classical view on rationality, what we have is something that Engel has described as follows. An activism is the view that cognition is grounded in a pre-rational understanding of the world that is based on sensory motor acquisition of real life situation. And he explains this, uh, the, this idea of pre-rational understanding by um, um, in, by by the, the, the ideas of Melopontin Heidegger, according to whom the relation to the world can be only one rooted in practice, in acting, in acting, and practice in turn is mediated through the body. So what seems to be implicit here is that unlike acting and practice, rationality is not actually bona fide embodied. It is something that is not uh, at the very basic level of cognition. So this is what happens when we, we uh, make room for a basic level of cognition rooted in act and in practice and divorce it from upper levels of cognition that they are usually the locus, the, the locky classic of uh, rationality. So the idea in, in summation is that contentless cognition or basic cognition that which emerges through sensory motor engagements is not rational. So sensory motor engagements, however virtuous and prolific they can be, cannot be evaluated from the standpoint of rationality. Only contentful cognition, high level cognition can be rational. Cognition that is expressed, for instance, in beliefs and reasoning. And well, this is something that I uh, haven't touched upon on the paper, but it was my implicit motivation to deal with uh, this subject as someone that comes from philosophy of the mind is the idea of the myth of the given, at least a version of it. It seemed to me at the time, and uh, I was correctly persuaded by a reviewer not to touch on the subject. It was uh, very <laughs> convoluted in my initial presentation, but it seems to me that if we divide basic cognition from uh, rational thought and action, and we do not point towards a, well, there is no, I mean, intersection between the, these two levels. It seems that radical and activism and uh, similar views would be committed to the myth of the given, 
popularized by sellers and uh, more recently by McDowell as a, a problem for empiricist views on, on the mind. So it seems that this is, I think, a, um, a, a philosophically interesting problem, but it's not something that is uh, on the forefront of the paper. It was my implicit motivation here that to explain how can we combine the contentless or basic level of cognition through sensory motor en engagements with rationality. If we cannot, it seems that uh, there is a given of some sort that is being uh, not completely explained in our picture of the mind. So this is something I wanted to do. I still want to try to explore this, this intuition more clearly, but I haven't touched upon this. Uh, but I, I think there's something in the direction of what, why, what I will show today is, I think it's a way to, to ease this, this accusation of being committed to the myth of the given. So how can we reconceive rationality? I mean, I think in order to avoid that issue and avoid the idea that we have two levels completely separated from each other, where one, the, the higher one is the, the locus classicus of rationality and what else is beneath it is not rational. I think the idea is to reject that rationality must be defined or entails necessarily reasoning. Rationality does not need to be so conceived, but then the challenge becomes uh, to offer a positive uh, proposal of what rationality is, if not reasoning. And here is Susan Hurley in a paper that, to my knowledge, is the only one that touches upon this subject. And I think she was also concerned about the myth of the given, by the way, at the time. And here is uh, a long quote from her, if you don't mind me reading it, is that rationality might emerge from a complex system of decentralized higher order relations of inhibition, facilitation, and coordination among different horizontal layers, each of which is dynamic and environmentally situated. Rationality reconceived in horizontal or modular terms. Uh, I don't know if she, she has to use this, this terminology, but anyway, that's how she chose to, to express it. Is substantively related to the environment. It does not depend only on internal procedures that mediate between input and output, such as content, either for the organism as a whole or for a vertically bounded central cognitive module. Rather, it depends on complex relationships between dedicated world-involving layers that monitor and respond to specific aspects of the natural and social environment and of the neural network and register feedback from their responses. This, to my knowledge, is the earliest case of uh, someone working on uh, the inactive approach, in a way. Hurley is uh, obviously more... Uh, usually associated with the, the work of Alvano, which is also an activist, but in a different approach from radical activism. And here is the, the earliest, and then to my knowledge, before I wrote that paper, is that the clearest uh, proposal of rationality reconceived in negative terms. But it not, it's not something that uh, gained traction after her publication. To my knowledge, at least, I, I haven't seen much since then. And... To summarize, the idea is that to, we have to change the explanatory focus, which is rationality is not exclusively thought of as a content involving capacity in this proposal. It is situated or world involving in Hurley's words, and it is, it, it is radically embodied. It depends on bodily morphology and action and uh, how the, the organism is situated and acts in that environment. The idea would be minimally that. So this is what I call radically inactive rationality. It is uh, in a very uh, loose definition so far is that an agent acts rationally insofar as she maintains a proficient interaction with her environment, coordinating her cognitive abilities according to environmental conditions of constraints and solicitations. And of course, this sometimes requires adapting to unforeseen circumstances. The, 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 the core intuition is this. And it's interesting to compare this idea of radical and active rationality with another uh, of Susan Hurley's ideas in a text from 2003. She's, she says, 
reasons uh, for acting, she argues that reasons for acting may be context bound, where she's arguing against uh, Gareth Evans' generality constraint. And this is the defense of her idea of islands of practical rationality. So she is still treating rationality as essentially something that relates to reasoning here, but this kind of reasoning is uh, bounded by practical context. So this is a very progressive view if you compare with the traditional view I, I talked about at the beginning, but it's still more conservative than what I am trying to develop here. So another thing that I think must be uh, in there, the forefront of this proposal is that rationality implies agency and autonomy because something or only something that an organism does can be said to be rational, right? So to use these, um, these ideas from the autonomist and activist uh, uh, camp and from uh, the, the theory of autopoiesis, autonomous systems such as a Roomba cannot be rational because it's not an agent. It is not uh, the author of its own behavior. It is designed by external agents to work in a certain way. So it's not strictly speaking an agent. So that is where I would draw the line of where, well, you cannot, uh, it makes no sense to ascribe rationality to a Roomba, for instance. And uh, for this, I, I use the, the notions of autonomy and adaptivity that Di Paolo and others, you have also the, the recent book I mentioned, Before Sensory Mother Life, and that famous paper from Di Paolo from 2005, where he talks about the adaptivity, to, to set these very general constraints on what it means to be rational. So autonomous systems are thereby conceived as precarious networks, uh, a precarious network of processes whose organization and physical boundaries are produced by the system itself. The system is continually maintaining its own uh, viability conditions, which is uh, known as sense-making, where the system explore uh, uh, the environmental, environmental conditions that are favorable to its uh, self-maintenance and avoids the ones that are detrimental to it. So this is how I understand to be that the the very in general that the the most general constraint on a rational being that it must be an autonomous system and the interesting thing here is that the concept of adaptivity that Paolo puts forth is that the capacity of an organism to improve its condition of self production through internal structural changes so it involves the monitoring and regulation of internal changes in order to select the best available course of action. This, I think, it's another interesting concept to think in, uh, of to, to to include in this idea of a radically inactive notion of rationality, one that is not necessarily committed to reasoning and content. So agency is realized through the exercise of situated abilities that promote changes within the organism in accordance with environmental constraints and solicitations. Which means that how well an organism adapts in order to deal proficiently with its environment is um, a measure of or an indication of its rationality. The more rational an organism is, the more suited it is to deal with its environment and with unforeseen circumstances. And in doing so, the organism enhances the continuous exchanges between uh, itself and the environment, which is crucial for its survival. And in this very naturalized way of thinking of rationality is mostly a capacity to, to enhance chances for survival. This is the, the overall idea here. So as I said before, what about reasoning? I want to, I don't want, to commit rationality necessarily with reasoning. And this is what radically inactive rationality is all about, but I don't want to exclude reasoning as a, a form of rational cognition. So what I'm saying is that it's not defined by reasoning, but it's not, uh, it does not exclude reasoning. Reasoning, I think, would be thought of as a special or a specific mode of rational agency, one that is exclusive to our knowledge to human beings. 
but it's not the defining feature of rationality. So for this, I, uh, in order to, to explain this idea, I recall how Hutu and Satin and Hutu and Min in, uh, in, in a paper in, a, in the most recent book by Hutu and Min, they explain the emergence of higher cognition. The idea is that being able to engage in contentful cognition ultimately depends on being social culturally embedded, where contentful cognition emerges from social cultural interaction. So as an individual takes part in social cultural practices, they uh, accept more ancient cognitive abilities to deal with symbols. And by doing so, they, um, in a long process of uh, enculturation, of course, they become able to engage with uh, symbolic cognition, which is not internal representations per se, because it is publicly available. It's not mental representations in the traditional sense, but it has the features of symbolic cognition without the, the commitment to internal representation or mental representations. So acting rationally in its most general sense is the idea that the proficient behavior of an organism is, in, uh, is, is the proficient behavior of an organism in its environment and depends on the coordination of embodied abilities. Whereas reasoning, if everything goes well, of course, is understood as contentful rationality, a form, a specific mode of rationality. Reasoning is the proficient behavior of an organism in its social cultural environment, which is a more specific aspect of our environment, of course. And it depends on the coordination of social culturally based or content involving abilities, which are more recent in the, the human phylogenetic scale. So, well, this is the the biggest of the idea. This is the, the I think, uh, the, the propositive part. And here are the objections I wanted to talk about. First one being that it's a very liberal view. It's very, uh, it, it, it is, well, it encompasses too much, one would say. Because if rational action boils down to the coordination of cognitive abilities, then rationality is something gradual for an organism could be more or less proficient in its environmental interactions. And the, the, the objection goes, according to radically inactive rationality, many organisms achieve and maintain an adaptive behavior in their niche with different levels of success, to which I am, uh, well, someone could say rational and active, uh, radically inactive rationality is too liberal, and this is one objection that I, I've heard in person and I, I kept it to heart because I think it's very, it's a very good way of putting it. Even snails are rational on <laughs> this view. And uh, to which I must say that I am willing to, to bite the bullet. Uh, well, yes, it's more liberal than traditional views, of course, it is intended to be so. But I don't think that is per se a problem. What I think is the, the, the positive part here is that it preserves a difference of degree. Humans are way more rational than other animals simply because we are able to perform a wide variety of actions in a wide variety of dynamic circumstances that are way beyond any other animals that we are aware of. So to, to come back to the example of the snail, the snail can perform a few complex actions, can move from one point to another, it can search for food and shelter and so on and so forth, but they have a critically limited set of abilities. If you surround a snail with uh, salt, for instance, it is doomed to, to die by dehydration. And humans, on the other hand, are much more adaptive and able to deal dynamically with many unforeseen circumstances. So uh, my response to that objection is that yes, uh, well, it is, very liberal, but that's not the problem. The problem would be if that it, it if it had the room for a difference of degree between how animals deal with their environments. So, and and this is the other object objection, which I think it may be the the one that interests you the most. Daniel, is that well, predictive processing seems to imply inferences and content all the way. Uh, but at first, I must. Uh, warn you and the viewers that 
at the time I wrote this uh, this paper, I was much more optimistic about this possibility of combining an activism and predictive coding or predictive processing. And uh, I think there are important points here, but there is this recent paper by Paolo and uh, Evan Thompson and Randy Beer, where they, are, they, they provide a critical assessment of uh, the, 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 the attempts to combine mainly the free energy principle and uh, um, an active and uh, autopoietic theories. So I am now mostly convinced by their arguments, but I think there, there are some interesting points of comparison here nonetheless. So predictive processing or predictive coding uh, at the time I was writing and still to this day is all the rage in the cognitive sciences, I guess you can say that it's on its way to become the, one of the main paradigms out there. So it is interesting to see if it provides uh, a good fit with what I'm talking about. And in this view, as you know, cognition is understood as a process of error minimization that occurs in bidirectional neural hierarchies. So you have the generation of internal models for the activity of lower layers that anticipates the distal causes of sensorial stimuli, which is a top-down process, and the minimization of discrepancy between prediction and current stimulus signal by um, the optation of priors, which is a bottom-up process. So here is, of course, active inference, which is understood by, for instance, in informal in informal terms by Clark, that an organism moves its sensors in ways that amount to actively seeking or generation, the generating the sensory consequences that they, or rather, their brains expect. This is one way of understanding active inference in very informal terms, but. I think it gets uh, the job done. So is the brain inferring the expected source of received stimuli? If it is, it seems that there is a, there's an issue with what I'm talking about. So the Hemholtzian reading of predictive processing, which is uh, which uses the broadly by as an inference, right? Says, for instance, that the process of perception is thus inseparable from rational broadly by process of belief fixation and context top-down effects are felt at every intermediate level of process. And this has called my attention the way that Clark uh, is also talking about rationality all the way, but it's an inferential sort of rationality. And pervasive inference or reasoning seems to imply pervasive content. And then predictive processing seems to be incompatible with radically inactive rationality. Well, but there is, uh, at the time there was, and I think we can still argue in favor of the, this no, non Hemholtzian reading of predictive processing, which uses, for instance, a, one first step would be to use a deflationary sense of prediction that Anderson and Camero in a short paper from 2013 put forth where the values of two or more variables co-vary or are vary reliably. So the value of one allows the observer to infer the value of another. And here the inference is happening, happening at the level of the observation, not that one var of, uh, variable is inferring the value of another. So the idea would be, I think, that content is in the eye of the beholder. The person who interprets how the selection of sensorial input approximates internal predictions, here understood in the deflationary sense, can describe it in inferential and Bayesian terms. So this is how I see, for instance, the, the, the idea put forth also by Brunneberg, Rittfeld, and Kieverstein in that paper, which, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, title is something like, the brain is not a scientist, and the argument is in this general direction that we are pro uh, projecting how scientists construe brain activity as a feature of the brain itself, as if it were predicting and inferring this more uh, ro robust or weightier sense. So what I'm trying to say here is that active inference, and I use double, um, how to say double, forgot the name of this in English, <laughs> sorry. 
Um, it's not uh, the, the literal sense of inference here, according to radically uh, inactive uh, rationality, is that a norm for the efficiency of goal-oriented behavior. The agent has to act in certain ways in order for his, his or her states come to fruition more efficiently, less costly. This does not imply the more contentious claim that the generative models themselves display and perform predictive inferences. This is a very deflationary reading into predictive processing to, to provide this um, combination with radically inactive rationality. And here is uh, Kirchhoff in a, in a paper from 2018. By model, it does not follow that an organism has an internal representational model of its niche and that it is this model that does all the cognitive work, if you like. Instead, an organism is a model. That is, the causal and statistical regularities reflect in some environment are reflecting some phenotype. That is, a model. And, well, this relates to something that recently uh, my colleague Nara Figueiredo and I have been talking about, uh, the idea of how organisms bring forth a world according to inactivism, which is the idea that the organism and environment are historic, historically co-determined. So at a phylogenetical scale, this could be explained through the idea of niche construction, the idea that once an organism is active in its environment, it promotes changes that if they are stable enough, they can be inherited by its offspring. And these changes provide new uh, evolutionary press, uh, pressure, pressures that are uh, that lead its evolutionary pathway. A similar idea has also been explored by Evans Escribano this time relating niche construction and uh, ecological psychology. So my, my, my response to that objection is that to act rationally means to achieve a proficient engagement with the environment through, in a way, prediction and error minimization. I'm willing to accept that characterization, but rational and broadly Bayesian processes need not imply content for cognition if we, if we understand that in a deflationary sense. Prediction and error minimization involve the selection of input and the coordination of linked abilities in world involving manners, which is, well, exactly the main claim of radically inactive rationality. So I think to that extent that predictive processing is not uh, an enemy, it would be rather an ally of this idea instead of a, a, a rival. But of course, there are other issues of compatibility that I haven't. I haven't touched upon here, but that uh, is all that I have thought of for today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Cool. Very interesting. For those who are watching live, please feel free to write any questions. I will gather my notes and let's begin the discussion. Okay. Well, first, just oh, thanks again for the talk. How about a little context on how you came to be asking these questions in your current position and how your interests in this area developed? Because there's so many interesting ideas and I just wanted to learn more about how you came to this framing and sharpened your point. Okay, thank you. That's that's a good question because it's not often that you can explore this background uh, matters. So uh, I was at the time. I think I was writing my PhD dissertation. It was maybe 2017 or something, and uh, I was arguing for the idea that rationality must be something that is ultimately world involving. There is a tendency to think of. Well, even among, as I, told, as I showed you, among uh, in, in embodied theorists, we think of certain abilities to be essentially word involving, such as acting and practice and so forth, and perception, of course, but rationality remains something like a naturalizable notion, something that cannot be uh, brought down to the level of uh, the, the 
it, it could not be scaled down in a way uh, like perception that could be explained by a certain dynamic engagement, so on and so forth. So at the time I was thinking that, well, maybe this is an issue because on other uh, other contexts, it, it is taken to imply that whatever perception is, if it is not articulated in a way to provide a certain fit with um, rational cognition, then perception is a given. And this is the myth of the given I mentioned at the beginning. And I thought that, well, maybe this is something of, there, there is something of a myth of the given working here on an active cognition, but this is not, I think it's not fatal because we could in principle argue that instead of uh, construing percep perception and other basic forms of cognition as involving concepts and the like, maybe we could argue from the other direction, try to scale down rationality at a more nat naturalized level of uh, perceptual cognition and the like. So that was the motivation and uh, it was very, it was a long review process and I believe that my first, the, the first uh, version of the paper, the, the, the reviewer was very, I think they were correct entirely. I, I endorsed the suggestion after all, but he was very, um, they were very adamant on taking that part. And I think it was for the better because it, it, it is another literature. It is another, uh, a lot of, Reference that they are not usually in conversation with an activism and embodied cognition. And it was very difficult just to put the matter in the same terms to advance my argument. So it's something that I scratched out and I haven't thought too much about that since then. But I think it's something I would like to come back to. And maybe uh, even probably someone has done so in the in this last few years. I'm not aware. I, I can't remember, but this relation between inactivism and the myth of the given, it seemed to me, it seems to me very obvious. So it is, I think, something that we could, we should, I mean, uh, be able to explore, but there's not something that was in the, the forefront of the paper. But but I had this idea to talk about rationality in, in uh, the flashnary sense. And at the same time, I was reading a lot about uh, coding from a philosophical perspective of course i'm not as i said very uh, well versed in the technicalities and the, the formalities of the, the, the approach but i was interested in the, the, the philosophical consequences there and i thought well maybe there's something to compare here because as clark's uh, quotations show you can talk about rationality all the way and uh, that's something i wanted to to develop but not in a cognitivist view, but in a radically embodied view. So that's the, 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 the background. Awesome. Thank you. Could you maybe describe just what is the myth of the given? What was the context that that myth arose in? And where do we go after bringing up the myth of the given? Because I, I saw it as a concept that you wove in. So what was it about? Okay, so the myth of the given is that, well, there are several possible givens depending on your flavor of philosophy of mind, but most classically empiricist views of the mind take the, 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 the content of perception to be given prior rationally in a way that we have certain inputs that are uh, just received by the mind and the mind interprets it. So Sellers, uh, Wilfred Sellers is famous for... Uh, having described this, uh, this problem as a problem for not only empiricist views of the mind, but also for rationalists, but on the, on the other side, rationalists usually take in, uh, in rational intuition as a given, which is to say that there is some, some level of cognition that is uh, unarticulated, it's given, or some people talk about being pre-given, but in a way, there is this level of um, cognition that is given and the mind has to interpret it. But if it is given in this way, it, it has no point of contact, no 
uh, intersection between whatever whatever mind does and the and this basic level of uh, cognition. So my idea is to avoid the, the the charge of being committed to the myth of the given. But again, this is not something that is explicit in the the activist literature, but it's something that seems to be possible to to develop in a in a in, in this sort of comparison but it's not it's not on the it's not clearly there but one way of solving the myth, myth of the given is to say that perceptual content is already conceptual in nature which is for instance how john mcdowell does in mind and world that in a way, perception, uh, the, the joke is, comes with uh, subtitles. <laughs> you in interpret the world as, as you do. But uh, I think that one way, another way is to demythify, in a way, rationality and the, the upper layers of cognition. Try and, and try to think of them uh, in less uh, contentful, in a less... Uh, without committing them so strictly speaking with a level of content that is divorced from basic levels of cognition. That's one way I think of doing so. And rationality seems to be the one uh, key concept to do this because it's so usually assumed to be something exclusively human and something that is related to reasoning. And well, if it is so, then Rationality cannot inform action, and if, of course, if action is uh, contentless in nature. So, if rationality is essentially contentful and action is essentially uncontentful or contentless, then you can you do not have this uh, touchstone, uh, this uh, intersection between two domains. And this is something I wanted to avoid, but as I told you, it became so hard to express these views in, in sufficiently clear and general ways that by recommendation of a reviewer, I scratched it out. And I, I, I'm, I still think about it, but not in, I haven't developed a proper line of argumentation that deals with it more clearly than I can do as I just did in very general terms. Cool. Well, some words that you associated with rationality were adaptivity and also proficiency. So what do you see as the relationship of rationality and fitness? Fitness as a biological function, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I, um, I think it is... It is an intrinsic relation, really. I think it is uh, uh, probably the most uh, um, obvious consequence of rational action at a species scale. And when we talk about whether rationality is a feature of uh, a certain species or instead of uh, individuals, I think fitness is one of the the key concept here to, to think this as the, the outcome of this uh, um, rational action. So although I do not say, I do not put it in those matters in the paper, I think it is possible to think it that way. I don't, don't see it as an, uh, as an objection to think, think of rationality in this way. But again, it's very liberal and I'm willing to, uh, to accept this consequence that well, every living organism in a way, if it, it, if it hasn't gone extinct yet, so it is in a way <laughs> fitted to its environment. So I'm willing to say that it may involve a minimal level of rationality of dealing with uh, a dynamically changing environment. But, uh, well, and, uh, it's the price of having a very uh, liberal, progressive notion of rationality. This is a consequence of it, I believe. So you said that fitness is, is a consequence of rational behavior. 
Are uh, there just, yeah. other consequences or how do we recognize rationality from the outside other than just saying, well, the ant colony is thriving. So to the extent that it is rational, it is adaptive and exhibiting agency and all of that. Um, is this such a deflationary rationality concept that all extant things, humans and otherwise, are merely described by it? Or are there some outcomes that we can use to disentangle, like, for example, a rational or irrational behavior from merely the consequences reflected by surv survival and fitness? Right. Well, I, I had to, to think very carefully about this because I don't want to trivialize this concept in a way that, well, everything is uh, ipso facto rational. By the matter of fact, it is living, it is acting rationally. But I think that uh, in particular cases, one could uh, identify the action that are inimical to the individual's um, self-sustainment in that niche. So at the individual level, in particular cases, one can clearly see certain actions that could classify as irrational to the extent that they uh, are detrimental to, to its survival. But uh, at the species level, it's more difficult to argue in that way because to identify this kind of behavior or consequence. But I think that in order to not to trivialize the idea of rationality and say, well, everything that is living is a fact rational. You'd have to, to identify this sort of particular acts that uh, are detrimental to, to, to one's survival. So in the case of the, the ant colony, I don't know, maybe uh, welcoming invasors would be, uh, <laughs> would be the, the sort of behavior that would be prejudicial to its uh, survival as such. I don't know. I don't know if this is a, it's one possible way of thinking about this. I had to think more clearly, but I'm careful. Well, so. oh, very interesting. And you brought in, in that answer and in the presentation, like multiple nested timescales, just like Eco Evo Devo does from a more biological perspective, looking at how niche construction bridges the gap between slower phylogenetic processes and more rapid developmental processes. Um, so how does this embedded and multi-scale consideration relate to the, the content concept? Like, is content going to be localized in one body or is the content distributed across entities or is the rationality distributed across entities? How would we even identify the locus of rationality? And that also kind of invokes the um, horizontal and modular conception from the quote that you provided. So how do we identify uh, salient spatial temporal scales and systems of interest? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, if I can answer uh, this fully, but it seems to me that uh, at the level of, uh, if we're talking about content, for instance, content as a, a crucial conditions for symbolic thoughts, I think forcefully we have to say that it's, it's not localized in a single individual. It's publicly shared. So you can say that um, one consequence of this is that it's possible to think of different uh, patterns of reasoning that have been uh, entrenched in different uh, societies at different times, etc. And you can see that, well, they develop different level, different uh, rules for content recognition. And I think this is plausible to say that content is, is localized at the, 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 the uh, how can you say it's shared among you know, the, the core specifics of if we're talking about you know, content domination at least. But as for rationality, I think one could um, identify in particular behaviors if it, it if it fits this uh, this kind of description of uh, 
it's been proficient uh, proficient interaction and adaptive interaction between an organism and uh, its environment its niche so probably we could uh, we could give different answers here As for rationality and content i i am willing to say that uh, content recognition is not something that happens in the head something that is out there in a way shared among others and this is something that uh, the philosopher of mind has uh, at least since the 60s uh, the philosophers of mind have been argued for the idea that uh, content is externally individuated and uh, i'm i think this is it, it is one of uh, the, the idea by for instance hillary putnam and uh, tyler burge and others that a mental content is individuated uh, at the community level or societal level but on the, on the other hand i think uh, rationality could be in principle individuated in particular behaviors but it would depend on the individual's goals and uh, the, the, the niche it inhabits and so on and so forth uh, there are of course contextual variables here that might be important to to identify behavior as rational or not thanks um well one phrase that really stuck with me was like know how not know that perhaps uh, a basal point in your work and a focus on the action so i just wanted to hear about how action and practice as you wove them here today how are those terms addressed and how are things different today with the treatment of action and practice and know how not know that than say in the Helmholtzian days or even in ancient or in world knowledge traditions so okay cool so the idea I think would be that um there is a tendency from uh, it is a tendency from at very least modern philosophy but it has been very influential in the, the first wave of cognitive science to think of perception as a, a capacity to uh, categorize the environment and to offer a discrete description of environmental aspects so for instance perceiving that uh, the, 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 I don't know, the, the cup is to my left is a matter of knowing that there is a thing with such and such properties to my left. And this is a kind of uh, know that, a kind of propositional attitude towards the world. So uh, I think the, the, the interesting thing about an activism and ecological psychology as well and to the extent that they recall uh, uh, American pragmatism from the, the, the beginning of the century is to think of perception as a matter of not categorizing discrete properties in the world, but as uh, disclosing possibilities for acting. And this is something that if we were to explain that in terms of uh, in epistemic terms, such as knowledge, we wouldn't put it as a matter of knowing that the, the, the cup is to my left, but knowing how to grab the cup and, and uh, do whatever I want to do with it. If I want to drink a cup of coffee or if I want to use it as a paperweight, it will have different silent properties. And this is something that, although it has been, I think, um, very, uh, I, I think in activism and ecological psychology and other embodied views of cognition, have been largely successful in uh, shifting this discussion to this point. I think in the uh, in more traditional cognitive sciences, you still have the idea that well, organism organisms perceived by by describing the way the environment. The, 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 this is something that I think uh, more traditional readings of predictive processing make uh, make clear as in um, the idea that we are inferring about the, the source of stimuli and not in, uh, and not in, this is not, I mean, this is more easily amenable to the idea that the, the brain or the cognitive system knows that 
the, the world is so and so, the environment is so and so, instead of saying that the cognitive system knows how to engage with the world. And I believe the, 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 the point that an activist and uh, ecological psychologist are trying to make is to, uh, in, and also working on the, the predictive coding and uh, the free energy principle, and etc., is to show that these notions, these frameworks, could be amenable to the idea that the cognitive system is knowing how to engage, it knows how to engage with the environment in a way. It doesn't need to be re read in a Helmholtzian way. That the, the, the cognitive system is inferring that the world is so and so. I think this is one way of putting it. But also, uh, philosophically, you have uh, a, a large, to, at the beginning of the, the, the last few decades, uh, a gigantic discussion about whether you know how could we reduce to know that. And then again, you have at the background of this another philosophical discussion about the, whether you know how could be treated as an independent notion from you know that and whether you could um, reduce one to the other and so forth. So uh, I think it doesn't stop there. You cannot, uh, even though I can make a, a claim for perception as a matter of knowing how, there's still the, the, the background issue of whether know how could be treated as a know that. And this is something that I am also working on recently. There's a lot to say there. It's it's such an interesting idea, especially with linguistic communication. It's a little bit like the finger and the moon and talking about the moon, but the finger is only where it is. And we're not talking about the pointer, we're talking about the referent. And so to use a socio-cognitive form of communication in, in cultured language or in written academic discourse to peer through that or to reimagine that and see even what seems to be like the pinnacle of know that and still see it as know how I guess the question there is, how do we read papers? Yes, of course. Yes, I think it it is uh, it is a uh, it, it's at the, at the very least it seems to be a, to be a very big problem because if we try to to, to treat these cognitive capacities as you mentioned as a matter of know how, it seems that we still miss something about uh, communication, for instance. And on the other hand, I think, and this is my intuition, but I think that we could, in principle, talk about how uh, understanding what you just said and trying to respond to it is a matter of knowing how to behave linguistically. But I think that even this movement to treat high levels of cognition as ultimately a matter of know-how. It still leaves something out. I am at, at I mean, personally, I am uh, unpleased with it. I think at some level, we gotta, gotta say that, well, there is another kind of approach that is needed here to explain how we communicate, for instance, in very articulate manner. Not to say that it does not involve a know-how, but it's not just that. I think that at, at least more than practical knowledge is needed. But maybe the key here is to think of practical knowledge as basic and necessary for other sorts of other, other kinds of knowledge that are needed to engage in this sort of exchange. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe this is one way I'm sure that, well, uh, more has to be said about this to give an, a more informative answer, but uh, this is uh, at least my current position, is that know-how provides the basis of our engagement with the world and with others, but at some juncture we have to, to be able to develop 
other kinds of understanding to explain at the at the least to explain the complex sorts of um, exchanges we have in our daily lives, such as reading papers, as you said. I I agree. I think framing know that as the basis and then recovering know how is a challenge. And it's also a challenge to begin with the basal cognitive processes as being enacted know hows and to reassemble those know how pieces into know that. Again, it's not necessarily even a simple challenge, but would we rather confront the challenge of assembling symbolic, propositional, declarative, verbal, etc., cognitive processes from a more liminal, ecological, cognitive approach, or try to recover the ecological from the Turing machine, in a sense. So it seems like um, you're speaking in support of grounding in ecological, plausible, basal cognitive processes, and then working towards assembling the skyscraper. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yeah, totally, yeah. I think it's, well, both are, uh, those bro both approaches are uh, difficult to, 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 to assemble, as you said, to, to, to provide this uh, sort of explanation, either bottom-up or top-down, but I am more favorable, of course, to the, the bottom-up approach. I think it uh, also, for another reason, it, it seems to, uh, the, the point of departure seems to be uh, a biological description of how we interact with the world. And the other way around, it seems to be much more difficult to explain uh, how we come up with these uh, biological questions, such as our body morphology and such. It seems that we have to first account for that, and then we, we get to the the other questions which are also hard to to answer but at the very least it i i, I think it's a uh, the, the bottom up approach is more uh, integrative in a way it's uh, the chances are uh, it seems to be more uh, in our favor in this sense and and the way you just kind of framed it made me think that if you were to program a computer from scratch it could be an abstract or a virtual computer, so it doesn't even need to have a specific embodiment. And in that situation, one might be concerned with assembling know that, assert that, and assembling these declarative statements and logic processes into something that is more dynamical or in interacting with the environment. However, that process of like full stack engineering with logic and silicone at the base is quite different from how we got here. And so it might, but it, it's complimentary. Um, well, you gave a little visibility into, uh, I guess, the before, during and after of peer review. So I was just curious, what changed during and after the paper like over the last months or years or however long it was how did you evolve on this and then what do you see as relevant next steps whether they're for you or just general to be done are we looking for a brain measurement are we looking for a video camera in a forest are we looking for a conceptual advance what is going to move forward past your developments that's that's a great question. I think um, I I'm not completely satisfied with the way I argued for in the paper at the conceptual level. I don't know if this any of this would be carried out in. Uh, I honestly don't know if you could, in principle, carry it out in other empirical terms. But uh, I'm not to say that. Uh, well. Point is, I would write it a bit differently today. Not that it's uh, not that I disagree with the paper originally, but I think I there's something, some points that I would like to reframe. But 
they do not authorize, uh, I, I think, yet a new paper. <laughs> so, but uh, maybe in the future. But this is something that the, two, uh, the, the question, such as the myth of the given, which is a, still the philosophical question and a conceptual one, they still uh, bother me, but I have yet to, to find the opportunity to develop these ideas more carefully and uh, the the general view I put forth there, I think I I think it still stands. Uh, but um, I would like I, I, st I still I'm waiting for this chance to elaborate it further and see how far I can get. But I don't know yet. I must admit I don't know what are the the the, the future developments of this idea. But um, I've been working on several isolated. Uh, uh, issues on this approach for the last few years. I've worked with uh, the notion of information and scientific understanding and information for ecological and, and, and activists of cognition. And recently I am working uh, more recently with uh, a few colleagues on uh, virtual reality and perception and cognition. So uh, this is how I like to, to conduct my research to find interesting uh, questions and see how how can I deal with them, but not necessarily find myself uh, tied to one one line of reasoning in that way. So this is what happened at the time I was working with rationality. I, I thought it was a, a very cool subject, and uh, I, I still think it is, but I haven't had the time to come back and reframe what I wanted to. But... Uh, Maybe, maybe sometime in the near future, I don't know. But more, the, the most recent thing I've been working on does not involve necessarily rationality, but I think uh, some parallels could be drawn, which is that of uh, virtual reality and how does uh, virtual reality actually compares to cognition because, well, th there's obviously something missing from a, a perceived in, in a, a virtual environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is, of course, I, if I someone, for instance, uh, if, I, if, if I'm on a virtual environment where I am under a kind of threat, I may feel something analogous to fear, but I'm not really fearing for my life. And the uh, immersion does that to the person on the virtual reality. So is it rational to, to run away from the, 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 the threat, the, the virtual threat, and so on and so forth. This is this the the, the this is what I'm working on, and uh, maybe it's it provides a point of return to this uh, idea of radically inactive rationality. And uh, in fact, uh, the the paper just got accepted. So as I was telling you before, I was so busy these last uh, few days because we were correcting proofs. My colleagues and I, Nara Figueiredo and Guilherme Vasconcelos, uh, and I, I was uh, the, uh, with a tight schedule to <laughs> to submit the corrected version of the paper in the last few weeks, and then I got the proofs. And so, uh, well, maybe uh, in the future I can come back to the issue of rationality. I'd like to, but I don't know if I, I don't know. I I really can't foresee the developments of that. But uh, in general, I still agree with my original idea, <laughs> but I frame it differently a little bit. So the VR point, I'm sure that there's a lot more to say there, but it reminded me of just the title, virtual reality. It's a virtualization. And so in the same way that cognitive action planning allows us to entertain policies that our body doesn't take if only to right. evaluate them and choose against them but we can go on a flight of fans fancy have a whimsical policy selection process of counterfactuals mentally but then our morphology is kind of like our lifeline you know if you actually fall off a ledge then it's going to hurt and then in virtual reality you're embodied perceptual experience is quite literally a virtualization of survival critical situations. So you might see yourself as being on a ledge, but you're on a flat floor. 
And then in that situation, if you're kind of um, a cognitive observer outside of the video game, you might say, well, it's rational for me just to fall off to see what happens. So that's right. like, but then there's a layer of rationality within the space. Yeah. It's like, what's a good move in the game? Um, and so it's kind of blurring the line between it's, it's blurring the criticality of the body. And, um, I'm sure you've thought about this much more. So how do you, how does this play into our virtual reality? Um, with the ways we think about and use and design these systems. Well, this is the, 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 the questions that motivated us to, to write a paper, uh, Nada, Guilherme and I, was that in the technical literature, you see that a lot of researchers working with VR treat uh, virtual perception as illusory, like a kind of illusion. But we were a bit bothered by that because, on the other hand, it only works in VR because we, we embody the devices. Devices... They work for us. You have the controllers, you have the, the headset. And uh, it seems so weird to say that the user, the, the, the user is under a kind of illusion. And on the other hand, it seems that it's not actually cognition because as you said, there is no, there is no biological uh, relevance to those uh, cognitive states, so to speak. For instance, if I see an apple in VR, it's, it does not afford nourishing, but it makes sense within the game, right? But it's different. Uh, well, when I perceive an apple in, a, in an actual environment, it, is, it, it affords nourishment. It is something that I can eat, but not in VR. I can pretend to. So we coined this uh, concept of allusion to explain. Uh, it is as if we were facing an actual apple, but it involves also this volitional play, this idea that we are not uh, being misled because we put on the equipment, we know we are in the game. And this, I think, is a hot subject right now because there's metaphors, and I am very skeptical of whatever <laughs> that can people are very optimistic but uh, about the possibilities of the metaverse and some authors really think that we could be in a simulation strictly speaking but I mean uh, the, the best that the current technology shows us is that it's, it's very limited and you can pretend to be in a certain environment and so forth and this I think uh, may offer a new uh, new ways of thinking of, of thinking about rationality in this virtual environment in ways that may be rational to do something in that environment, as you said, to jump off the, the ledge and see what happens. And uh, on the other hand, behavioral aspects of uh, doing so, sometimes people actually feel fear and people, for instance, treat pho phobias with virtual realities. And um, it's it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of inter interesting questions there. That, uh, but maybe, I mean, for future research, we can, yeah Come back to it 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 made me think about how the apple in real life it could be calories for you but also it could be calories for a fly it could be thrown you could use it as a hammer you could paint it right. so ecology and the generative process as we'd say an active inference kind of is always going beyond whatever affordances were programmed in for a given object and then also um, the current discourse on VR focuses heavily on headsets. Just speaking totally anecdotally, not, not my expert area. Um, it seems a little bit interesting. It's like as if the mobile phone discussion was only focused on rectangles of a certain size. What makes this not virtual reality? It's like looking through a window and there's another fellow to speak with. So it's not attached to my head. It doesn't have some of the motion tracking um, capacities that some technologies have, but it is a niche modification in peripersonal space and we can push signals and affordances to each other. So having a VR 
framing or really just a framing of rationality and perception, cognition, action cycles that aren't just constrained to one specific realization or hardware type and can run yeah. the gamut from total offline person in a field to somebody who's very in the matrix seems pretty relevant. Otherwise new technologies, even little variants and software updates will continue to just infinitely surprise and confuse. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a hard, it's hard to define the the boundaries of reality. In, I mean, we are here uh, in an exchange which I think it could, in principle, be classified as a form of virtual reality. Of course, I'm seeing your own, your see mine. But uh, the, I mean, most I think works nowadays. Nowadays, they they define it ad hoc by saying that well, must have a headset and sometimes a controller. But but other than that, it's not virtual reality. But yeah, it's hard to define. I think uh, it's not not it's not a not as straightforward as one would think. Because on uh, talking commercially, of course, virtual reality means headsets and and other paraphernalia. But <laughs> but a phone, well, just talking on the phone or a telegraph in that yeah. time, it would have been on that interface with that sensory modality and with those affordances, it is the virtualization yeah. that we have access to of just a different chapter today. Yeah, I think so, yes. Part of our paper was to argue that in a way embodying technological devices is obviously not, that's not new. It is the mark of being human. It's embodying technological devices that what made us uh, what we are since the beginning using lithic technology and the fact that we can embody it so proficiently a device even if it is programmed to for instance uh, in within virtual reality to have something a creature you control a creature with uh, new morphology uh, another morphology for instance even if that's the case it only happens so proficiently because we are able to embody the device. Some experiments have shown that you can map, for instance, a twist of your wrist to a third arm uh, that in, vir in virtual reality goes from goes out from the, your chest. And people can uh, learn to control this third arm that doesn't map into an actual morphology, but it can be made to do so by a, a twist of the wrist. So. This is something we discuss in our paper that well you can you can only do that because you embody the device so you can say it's an illusion it's actually uh, well part of what means being human is to embody technological devices so uh, I would go that way I mean, I mean I know it blurs the distinction between virtual and non virtual but mm -hmm. I think that's one way of dealing with this. Cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about, ask, or just kind of prelude? Uh, well, I, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper. It was very nice for me. I, I really enjoyed it. And this is a very nice and uh, comfortable environment to discuss these issues. And thank, thank you once again. Ed. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome discussion and important topics. And we'll be happy to talk to you again anytime. Okay, thank you. Farewell. Thank you.